Well, it's such a privilege uh, to turn to God's Word, and uh, welcome to those who are tuning in online and television and CD players and radio uh, and uh, uh, podcasts and all that kind of thing. Welcome. Uh, throughout our current series of messages over the last several weeks, we've been taking a closer look at Jesus' teaching found in the Sermon on the Mount that's found specifically in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And in these chapters, Jesus radically challenges our conventional thinking, uh, painting a picture uh, for all of us of what living as his followers looks like. And and Jesus' words throughout these chapters are undeniably hard-hitting. There's just no question about it. And and, uh, they often uh, call us uh, to see things in a way that is really opposite of the way we naturally think about things. Uh, Certainly opposite from our uh, default way of looking at things. And and because of that, all of us, if we're listening to any part of this series, and today is certainly no exception, ought to be finding ourselves challenged. uh, Challenged over and over again, deeply and personally challenged by Jesus' teaching. And uh, as I said, this morning is certainly not an exception to that. And it's my prayer that as we study the words of our Savior, that as we take a prolonged look, as we gaze on the words of the Lord Jesus, that all of us would find ourselves equipped to pursue a year of growth, to pursue Uh, our best year yet with Jesus. It's the cry of my heart that every follower of Jesus, that each and every year would say, I would long that I would be walking closer and having a deeper relationship with my Savior each and every year, a year of growth, our best year yet with Jesus. And now as uh, we begin, I'd like to, uh, before we turn uh, to the passage, I'd like for us uh, to just pause for a minute and think. And uh, I'm going to ask you to all ask yourself a question honestly. Think about it. Ask yourself, have I ever done good deeds, or what I'm going to use the term religious activities. So have I done good deeds or religious activities to get noticed or praised by other people? Think about that for a minute. And I think if we're honest, all of us have to some degree done this before. And if you're saying, not I, okay, but look a little deeper. I'm sure we've all done that. Maybe it was uttering some fancy and flowery prayer at Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner uh, because you knew that the whole family was there, and I want to make this impressive. So uh, you came up with... uh, Uh, something that sounded impressive to you and you thought it would be impressive to those around the table, except that if we're honest about it, you weren't really talking to the Lord. You were seeking to sound polished. Or maybe, uh, just maybe, it was praying before a meal when perhaps your family doesn't regularly practice that very good practice, which it is a very good thing to give thanks to the Lord for our daily food before we eat. Jesus, as a matter of fact, gave thanks before he fed the 5,000. So a very good habit. But, uh, you know, as pastor, I can just say that I've seen this over the years. I don't have anybody in mind specifically, but I've certainly witnessed this, where those who clearly do not have this healthy habit, well, when the pastor's looking, we're going to come up with something. And it sometimes is intended to sound good, but sounds rather awkward. Um, maybe it's because mom and dad were around, we knew that they'd be pleased. So again, it's praying, but it's not really talking to the Lord. It's, well, that family member that really thinks we should pray before food. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, kind of check that box. I'm going to show off. I, I got this. Or maybe the pastor or whatever, you know, worse yet, the pastor or whatever the case may be, all sought to impress somebody else. Or how about giving a donation to a good cause and making sure other people know about it so that our good deed will certainly be recognized in getting noticed and being rewarded. I mean, certainly helping the poor or or giving to the church. I mean, these are good things, but are you doing, but have we fallen into the fact of making sure everybody knows that, you know, hey, we we did that. Well, Jesus' teaching today gets to the heart of this kind of thing. It it really does. Um, 
doing good deeds and or those kind of religious activities, whatever they may be, to get notice is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 6. And it'll be on the screen behind me. It's in the bulletin, but you can also turn there in your Bible. It's a great idea. And this is the first verse. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. We must guard against hypocritically seeking the recognition and praise of others. Uh, The first verse is really a summary of the whole theme of the first 18 verses, if you will, of Matthew chapter 6. And the verse is an introduction to the whole passage. It sums up the big idea. It's the bottom line of this section of the Sermon on the Mount. Listen again to the first half of the verse. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Jesus is saying, watch out. And then verse 2 begins focusing on a specific example, that of giving to the needy, saying, thus, when you give to the needy. Then verse 5, a different topic, prayer, and when you pray. And then verse 16, the topic of the spiritual discipline of fasting, and when you fast. And in each of these cases, be it giving to the needy, prayer, and fasting, we're to beware of practicing our righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, uh, for then you will have no reward. If we do this, we will have no reward from our Father who is in heaven. That's verse 1. Now, Verse 1 is so vital, I, I, wanted to, I want to read it in a couple of more paraphrased-oriented uh, renderings uh, of this verse. The ESV is a great translation, but I want to put it in different, more contemporary words to try to help it sink in, uh, to sink in what we're to watch out for. Uh, this is the New Living Translation, again, known for its contemporary language, not as much of a literal translation, more of a paraphrase, but here very helpful. Watch out! Get that? Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose your reward from your Father in heaven. Friends, we're to watch out. That's what that's saying. And then this is the the message, which again is a paraphrase. It's essentially a commentary. It's rendering uh, the idea, but it's not a literal translation. But here again, it, it gets at the sense of it. Be especially careful when you are trying uh, to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but God who made you won't be applauding. You know, be careful when you're doing good to make a performance about it because it might look like good theater, but God, he's not clapping. Again, that's a paraphrase. It's not a literal translation, but it gets the sense of it. It helps us to see what's going on here. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, I I, I get it. I think I get it. We must avoid doing good deeds to get recognition, to get praise uh, from other people. We must do such good deeds, certainly, but we do them out of a deep love for and out of a relationship with the Lord. They spring forth from a heart that is deeply devoted to the Lord. They spring forth from a relationship with the Lord. They spring out of a a deep love for the Lord, and and they must not be motivated by self-serving purposes. You know, doing such as doing religious activities to get congratulation, uh, praise. We must avoid doing things to get noticed. That said, doing things with the goal of recognition is a natural and very easy trap to fall into. It's oh so easy. And Jesus teaches that it's a completely empty path to be walking on. If we head down this road, God does not reward our behavior, and friends, the only audience that matters ultimately is who? The Lord himself. I I love the phrase, uh, it's not original to me, I've heard it many times, I don't know who came out with it first, but uh, friends, as Christians, we ought to live for an audience of one. One An audience of one, we live for the Lord. And uh, so, his perspective on things is all that matters. 
And God sees everything, and he will reward us. But if we are hypocrites and do things to be noticed and rewarded by people and set out of love for him, we forfeit that heavenly reward that he would otherwise give. So we must really carefully avoid and stand guard against the temptation of this trap, or this hypocritical trap. Jesus is concerned with our motives, with what's on the inside, with what's in our hearts. And throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he calls us again and again to look beyond the surface level of things to what's on the inside. And if we fall into the trap again of selfishly seeking recognition by others, Jesus tells us that the only reward that we'll ever get is the very temporary praise we get from people. And you know what? That applause, it's over very quick. Now, I'd be willing to guess that some of us are saying, in the back of your mind, you're saying, okay, hold on a minute, because... Uh, I remember that in Matthew 5, it talked about letting our light shine, and obviously if we let our light shine, people will see it. Well, let's talk about that. You're asking the question, how does practicing your righteousness before other people to be seen by them, not doing that, avoiding this performance, fit with Jesus' call to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world? Well, if you roll your eyes back to Matthew 5.16, so just a chapter back, we read, in the same way, let your light shine before others. Now you would say, okay, here's the question. That certainly means it's going to be noticed. If you let your shi light shine before others, it will be noticed after all. But let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So uh, letting our light shine, it's going to be noticed. 1 Peter 2.12 describes a similar thing. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers they may see your good deeds after all it's going to be noticed they may see your good deeds and glorify god on the day of his visitation but look closer there are huge differences between these passages between chapter 5 verse 16 of matthew 1 peter 2 12 and here in matthew 6 1 enormous differences in 6 1 what is forbidden is seeking to be noticed or praised personally seeking our own recognition it's about seeking praise for ourselves. Uh, the issue is seeking to make ourselves look good. And on the other hand, back a chapter ago in Matthew 5 and in 1 Peter 2, the topic is doing good with the express purpose that God will be praised. It's about glorifying God. You see the difference? The difference is who gets the praise. And the difference, though it may sound close, is actually seismic. We must avoid seeking to exalt ourselves while actively seeking to encourage people to glorify and praise the Lord. Now, throughout this passage, we're going to look at three topics quickly. Giving to the needy, because the passage addresses it. Prayer, the passage addresses it. And the spiritual discipline of fasting, the passage addresses it. And the message is clear. Don't do these things to draw attention to yourself. Verses 2 to 4. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. There's a right and a wrong way to give to the needy, friends. Now, first, did you catch the assumption, it's an important assumption, by the way, that we will give to those who are in need? Certainly, we don't always desire to do this. Certainly, we don't always think this way. There are plenty of people who have little or no desire to care for those in need. There's a natural temptation, now, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, who said something like this, Because, but it is natural. Our, our sin nature produces this. It's easy when you see someone in need to go, that's their problem, not mine. And I'm sure many of us have had those feelings. And yet Jesus challenges the way we naturally think with an assumption, and the assumption is that we will give to the needy. The, verse 2 begins, thus, when you give to the needy. Verse 3 begins, but when you give to the needy. Can you see the assumption? It says when you give to the needy, not if you give to the needy. There's a difference. And the difference is obvious as it is significant. 
The Bible assumes and requires that we will show compassion toward the poor. Such acts of mercy are assumed. And that observation might challenge some of our attitudes, quite frankly, toward those who are in need and remind us that we must care. Compassion toward the poor is assumed in God's word. Here are just a few examples. Deuteronomy 15.11. For there will never cease to be poor in your land. Therefore I command you, notice it says I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. I command you. Psalm 41, verse 11. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Or I think of the New Testament letter of Galatians after Paul had met with the Jerusalem apostles and laid out to them the gospel message that he preaches among the Gentiles or non-Jews. They encouraged him and said, keep doing what you're doing. And Paul says the only thing they asked is that we continue to remember the poor. And Paul adds, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the very thing we were eager to do. So there's there's a real assumption here that we will care about the poor. Now with that in mind, with all that said, we must avoid drawing attention to ourselves and to our gifts when we help or give to those in need. Now there's a discussion here, because you might have noticed as I read it, it talks about trumpets. And there's a discussion here as what is referred to with giving that's announced by trumpets. Now, I'm not going to settle the discussion among Bible scholars. There's a couple of very legitimate possibilities, uh, several different opinions, and it could refer to the fact that the temple offering receptacles were horn-shaped. So some think that they were like shaped like trumpets, uh, so that this could be like trying to give publicly uh, as you throw your offering into this trumpet-shaped offering uh, you know, container. Uh, and this could be a figurative way, essentially, of saying, don't draw attention to yourself, in the same way that don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, is talking about um, secrecy. Uh, of course, our, our left hand and our right hand is controlled by the same brain, uh, but that's a figure of speech, uh, saying, uh, you know, do it in secret, do it quietly, don't draw attention to yourself. This could also refer, though, to blowing trumpets to draw attention, like as in the actual instrument, to draw attention to what was happening. Namely, a gift being given, and it might be a combination of the options, because trumpets were used at the temple in worship. Now, I would favor to say it was actually literal trumpets, but there might be a combination because it might be, don't announce it with trumpets as you throw your offering into the horn-shaped offering container. This is something like, don't toot your own horn, guys. Anyway, announcing it with trumpets is drawing attention. And it's something that hypocrites do, and Jesus says it's to be avoided. Jesus is clear that if we seek to be noticed by others, we've had our only reward. We hope, I hope that it was very enjoyable because those temporary rewards where people clap and say, hey, look, he's over at the, you know, the offering and the trumpets are sounding and look at this amazing thing that this person's doing. Do you think anybody remembers tomorrow? The congratulations are over and they're over quick. Now you say, what do we do with this? Well, how about philanthropists in corporate public relations stunts with huge checks. I mean, isn't this something that our culture celebrates? You know, pictures everywhere, giant, you know, giant checks and those kinds of things, and everyone's cheering. Buildings that bear people's names. Plaques on the wall saying you're benefactors. Well, as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to be different. And it certainly shouldn't be how we support the Lord and his work. 
And we need to be careful even in general because here's the temptation with large checks, you know, with everybody standing up front and clapping, with putting names on buildings and all those kinds of things. And, I, you know, I understand there's a discussion. But let me tell you, here's the temptation. When we take all that credit, we're saying, look at me, okay? And that brings a very distinct temptation for us to start thinking, you know, I'm somebody special. I've done a lot of good. And you know how close that gets to? It's just one tiny step away from pleading our performance rather than the grace of God. You see the danger? Pride says, look what I do, look what I've done, I'm a good person. Look what I've got, I've got this. And the gospel says, oh no, I don't. I don't got this. I need Jesus. And the danger in this sort of public showiness is uh, a lot of things, but one of the things that it very significantly can do is it can put us on a path where we begin to plead our own performance and start tricking ourselves into thinking we're pretty good and that we've got this and God, uh, you know, I'm awesome. And you know what? That's on a path that leads right down the, the, the way of, away from the gospel. We need to be careful about seeking notice, aiming to get praise from others rather than praise from God. We live for an audience of one. At least I pray that we do. You know, verses, six, uh, verses 5 to 15. And when you pray, so now the subject is going to switch again, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We must guard against this deadly temptation, these deadly temptations in the area of prayer. Jesus clearly teaches here, again, that his followers are to be praying people. We come face to face with this in verse 5, and when you pray. Again in verse 6, but when you pray. Verse 7, and when you pray. In verse 9, pray then like this. You getting the sense? We're to be praying people. It's assumed. It reminds me of 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. And then verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 5, Pray without ceasing, or that could also be translated, pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Or Ephesians 6.18, praying at all times. Again, without ceasing, continually. And when you pray, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Friends, we ought to sense a challenge. We don't pray enough. We don't. Every follower of Jesus, I mean, if we're pursuing our best year yet with him, we should grow in the area of prayer. Uh, I'm speaking to myself. We need to be people of prayer. And this is assumed because it says three times here in the passage, and when you pray. Now, as we look a little closer at verses 5 to 15, we see that the section divides into a couple of different parts. And Jesus teaches first how not to pray in verses 5 through 8, and then how to pray, and then after teaching how not to pray, he then turns to how to pray in verses 9 to 15. So let's begin considering how not to pray. And we're going to sense a theme continuing with what we just talked about, how not to give to the needy. We are not to pray to be noticed by other people. 
We're not to think that many words, and we're not to think that many words will impress God. Look again at verse 5 in the trap of seeking the notice of other people. Jesus says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray on, in the synagogues and on the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Sound familiar? It's the same thing, but the topic has changed. What were the hypocrites doing? They were praying to be seen and praised by other people and not to communicate with God. Their motives were all wrong. They uh, make it all about being seen and rewarded by others rather than communicating with our, our Lord. To put it simply, do we pray to be seen by people or pray to be heard to communicate with God? And I encourage all of us to search our hearts personally and ask the Lord to show us, ask the Holy Spirit to show us, if we're personally falling into this trap because, oh, it's so much easier to fall into than we would ever want to admit. It's been said if we pray more in public than we do in private, we probably have the problem. If we're eager to pray when others are watching but not when we're alone, we probably have fallen into the trap. Instead of praying to be noticed, Jesus calls his disciples to pray in private. Now, I don't think that excludes all public prayer or all prayer in groups because there's plenty of prayer in groups within the early church, even in Acts. But if we find ourselves praying more in public than we do in private, we need to beware because we might have subtly fallen into the trap of praying to impress others without even realizing that we were heading down that path. Now then, the second part of it, don't pray like, the second part of a a different trap, assuming that many words will impress God. Jesus makes it clear God is not impressed by meaningless words, by mindless repetition. Verse 7, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Jesus teaches that praying a thoughtless, heartless flow of many words accomplishes nothing. When we pray, we're to sincerely lift up our heart to the Lord, and God is not impressed by the volume or length of our words. We need to remember, God knows what is in our heart before we put words to it. He wants us to pray. We're to be praying people, but He isn't impressed by us babbling on and on and on. And that would be a paraphrase of what's described here. Meaningless repetition, just sort of babbling, going on and on, because if if I can pray for long enough, and even if it's really not saying anything, I think it's great to pray for a long time if it's substance, but if we're just kind of going on and on, ultimately that babbling on and on is thinking, well, maybe I can impress God and manipulate him. We can't. You cannot manipulate God. None of us. It's impossible. Now, after saying, okay, don't think that, God, you know, don't pray to impress other people and don't go on and on and on with meaningless repetition, babbling on and on, endless words that really don't say anything. Don't do that. After teaching us how not to pray, Jesus turns to teaching how to pray. And verses 9 to 15 contain what is commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. No, I'm not going to campaign for changing the title, but it would probably be better to describe it as the Disciples' Prayer because this is a model prayer. Jesus gave these words as a model to teach his disciples first, and ultimately we're his disciples, all who ever be his followers, to teach us how do we pray? What do we pray about? What should we pray? How do we pray? So this is a model prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples to teach them. Uh, Notice uh, in verse 9, if you're looking at the New International Version, begins this way. This then is how you should pray. Notice it says how you should pray, not this then is what you should pray. There's a difference. This is a model prayer for the purpose of teaching. It's an outline. And Lord willing, I'd like to spend next week unpacking the outline as a way of enriching our prayer life as we look at each phrase is a prompt for things that we ought to pray about. We pray then like this as we uh, are praying people. 
And I, Lord willing, I'd like to turn there next Sunday uh, just to zoom in on that verses 9 to 15. But for now, let's turn again uh, to, uh, to the final part of the passage and to the subject of fasting, and we're going to hear the same thing again with a different subject. Verse 16, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Does this sound familiar? Um, but, I, but when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who sees in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So here we're talking about avoiding the trap of hypocrisy in the subject of fasting. Now, as before, the main point here is that when you practice the spiritual discipline of fasting, don't make it obvious to others. Uh, People were making it obvious that they were fasting uh, so that they would get uh, admiration. They were showing off spiritually by making their faces look somber because, you know, I'm really looking sad and somber because I'm hungry, but I'm taking one for Jesus. I'm a super Christian because I fast. God's going, I'm not clapping. You see the difference? They were making themselves look sad and and ignoring their hygiene practices. That's uh, washing your face, putting oil on your head. Jesus makes it clear that fasting is to be done in secret and must not be done to be a spiritual show-off. Yet you can see how the temptation could be that, well, if I'm going without food to intensify my prayer life and to show my dependence on the Lord, that someone could come to the conclusion and try to impress others, look at the super spiritual person. Do it as a show-off, right? I see some of you nodding. You know exactly what's going on. And Jesus says, Don't do that. Don't fast saying, look at me. Now, fasting is an important spiritual discipline, and we don't have time to address the topic in great detail. Uh, But for now, a couple of things. The fasting described here was going without food for a period of time. The Pharisees typically did it for a day at a time. And fasting, I can speak first personally, if undertaken with humility, can heighten our awareness of our utter dependence on God and intensify our prayer life. It's a wonderful spiritual discipline fasting is very good and though it's often neglected there are lots of biblical examples i mean i think of esther fasting before her courageous and dangerous plan of going in to see the king uninvited and god used her to save her people did you notice if you look at the text closely she fasted before doing that for a number of days and invited others to fast with her and At the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey, then named Saul, we see that the church in Antioch was in a time of fasting. Acts 13, verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set aside for me Barnabas and Saul, who was later, shortly later, renamed Paul, for the work to which I have called them. So Jesus assumes that we will fast. He says in verse 16, And when you fast, in verse 17, But when you fast, So some of us today might be being challenged. Hey, you know, this is a a, a spiritual discipline that maybe I should consider. Stepping out and beginning to practice for the first time, perhaps, or maybe for the first time in a long time. That said, the big picture in this passage is don't use fasting as an opportunity for spiritual pride. Don't use fasting to be a deceptive tool that you can use in your mind saying, hey, look, I'm a super Christian. Don't do it. Remember verse 1? It's echoed throughout the passage. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. The motives behind what we do are vitally important. We've addressed three different topics. Our giving to the needy, prayer, and fasting. And the message is very clear. We must not use these acts of righteousness or these good things or any other good things for that matter to get noticed and praised by others. Friends, this morning, some of us need to repent of the way we've done good things. Because we've done good things. We've done our acts of righteousness for selfish reasons to seek congratulation from others. If that's you, Ask for forgiveness. Repent and turn, return to the Lord. 
On the other hand, uh, some of us are challenged because we see the importance, the vital importance of giving to the needy, of prayer and of fasting. And maybe we're saying, I need, I need to take, with God's help, and out of love for him, and out of a desire to pursue my best year yet with Jesus, out of a desire to have a growing relationship with him, I need to pursue these things. Absolutely. We're in different places. I do believe that honestly looking at this passage and honestly gazing at the temptation to do things that are good for the congratulation of others reminds us that so often, even when we do good things, we do them with horrible motives. So often. I'm speaking to myself too. And every time we see our sin, friends, that's a good thing. Because it shows us our desperate need for the Savior. It reminds us that we can, no one will ever plead before God, hey, look at me, look what I've done. The only way to stand before God is in Christ's perfect righteousness. And when we see that even when we do good, it's not so good after all, because often it's fueled by all kinds of wrong motives, we're reminded of our need for the Savior. We're reminded of our need for grace. And we're reminded of our need for His cross work. And that's a good thing. Because the primary motivation for living a life, a Christian life, is the gospel. The primary motivation for living a Christian life is the grace of God. And as we're reminded, as we see our sin, we see yet again our need for grace. Let's pray and then we can close in song. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friends, those here this morning in this room, those gathered online, those gathered uh, listening, those gathered uh, watching on TV, uh, just all of us in these holy moments, Lord. Show us where we need to take steps of growth to pursue our best year yet with you. Show us where we've been tempted to plead our own performance and remind us that we are utterly dependent on your grace. Help us to grow and pursue our best year yet with you, Lord Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, show us our sin and show us our need for your work on Calvary's cross. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.